Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, we are going to cover permissions. This is one of those things that might be a bit challenging for newcomers to understand, so I wanted to make this video to hopefully clear up how you can tell what permissions an object has and what the individual permission bits actually mean. So let's dive in and get started. So what I'm going to do right now is show you the output of the ls-l command. And I've already gone over the ls command as well as other commands that were related to directory traversal in a previous video in this series. But I'll press enter. And we can see the contents of my current working directory. And the dash l option of the ls command gives us a long listing. And that's especially important for us because that allows us to see the permission string for each item in our current working directory. And the first section here of each row is the permission string. And a good portion of this video is going to be helping you understand what this actually means and how you can translate these characters to an understanding of what the permissions are for each individual item. And the first thing to understand is that this string is actually broken down into four groups. The first group is just a single character, the very first character that you see here. And most of these have a first character of the letter D, but we also have a first character here that is simply a hyphen. D actually stands for directory. And as for me, I often use the terms directory and folder interchangeably, but just keep in mind that the D means directory and a hyphen, what does that mean? Well, that means that that particular object is a file. So this right here is just a simple text document that I created for this video. Actually, it has nothing in it. It has a file size of literally zero, but I wanted to have some sort of file here to illustrate the difference. So I've just gone over the first group here in the permission string, and the other three groups are broken down into three. So this is group number two, and this is group number three, and then this is the fourth group. So what I'm going to do is help you understand what each of these groups represents in the output. To serve as an example to work with, I have this line right here, which is an actual line from the ls-l command output from my desktop. This is a folder called vbox. It's where I basically have my virtual machine files, but we're going to pay special attention to the permission string all the way on the left. Now, I've already gone over the first character, which in this case is a D, and it lets you know whether or not it's a file or a directory, but it also lets you know whether or not it's a link, which would be L in this case if this was a link. I'm going to go over links in a different video, so I'm not going to spend any time on that, but if you were to check the LS output on various directories across your file system, you'll more than likely eventually run into a file that is actually a link, in which case the first character would actually be an L. So the first item here is very easy because it's just a single character and it lets you know what type of object it is on that line. Now the next group, which is actually consisting of three characters, represents the permissions for the user of that file or that folder. Essentially, the user that owns that file or folder. Now you'll notice I have user here at the top and it's pointing down to my name. You actually see my name twice. The first instance of my name is the user, so I own this directory. The second instance of my name is the group that owns the file or directory, which is also my name. It's very common in Linux that when you create a user, that there's actually a group named after the user as well, but that group could be anything. And we'll get into more about groups in just a moment, but for right now, we're going to focus on the user. So you know that I own the file, my name is there, and we also know that the R, W, and X pertains to me in some way, but what exactly does that mean? Well, actually, the R means read. I am able to read that directory. Now, if that was a file, then read is pretty obvious as far as what it means, 
If it's a file, that means I can read the contents of the file. So if it's a text file and it contains text, then I'm allowed to look at it. Now, when it comes to a directory, read means something different. It means I can read the contents of the directory. So I guess you could say that R in this case means you can read the contents of the item, whether that be the contents of a text file or the contents as far as what is inside a directory. So I am able to read the contents of that folder or that file, whatever it is, because I have the R bit set. The W means write. If this were a file, that means I can actually add content to the file. I could add a new line of text to a text file. If it's a word processor document, I can add some new sentences or a paragraph or something. I'm basically able to modify that item. If it's a directory, in which case this is, I am able to add content to the directory. I am able to put things into the directory. So I'd be able to create a text file inside that directory if I wanted to, because I have the ability to write to it. That's what W means. It means I can write to it. Now the X bit is a little interesting because it has two almost completely different meanings. They're similar, but different. If it were a file, that means I can execute that file as if it were a program. So for example, you could actually create a text file and put some Linux commands in there. And if it's marked executable, then that means you could run that file as if it were a program, which is essentially what a script is. A script is a file that contains commands that are to be interpreted by the interpreter on the command line. So if I was to, for example, add the ls command and save that into a text file, mark it executable, I could execute that text file and it would then execute the ls command. And that's possible because x is set in this case. But this is not a file though, this is a directory. But the x means when it comes to a directory, is that I can go inside the directory. I could change my current working directory to go inside that directory. If that permission was not set, it'd be a little weird because I'd be able to read the contents of that directory. I would be able to add files to that directory because I have the W bit set. But if the X bit was not set, I wouldn't be able to go into the directory, which is strange, but it is the case. So essentially we have R for read, W for write, and X for execute. And those three characters there, right after the first character, which is a D in this case, those three characters are the second group, and they pertain to permissions for the owning user. Moving on, we have the third group here, another group of three characters. In this case, again, it's R, W, and X. These permissions pertain to the group. In this case, the group is also me. When you create a user, you get a group. Not always, but a lot of distributions do that. And then by default, the files and folders that you create inside your home directory will be owned by you, your user, as well as your group. Now that in and of itself isn't that interesting. I mean, having a group that is named the same as me, that isn't the best example to be honest, but you can actually extend that a lot further when you are dealing with a file server. For example, you have some files that you want to make readable by an entire group of users. You can create a group, and then you can assign that directory and those files to be owned by that group. For example, you could have an accounting team at your company, and maybe this folder contains some very confidential financial reports for your company. You certainly don't want everyone to be able to see those reports, only the people that need to see those reports. In that case, perhaps you'd create a group called accounting. You would assign the object to that group, and then make sure that only that group can read those files that are inside that directory. You'd be able to do that because, well, you could create a group and then manage the permissions as you, the administrator, sees fit. So anyway, we have RWX again, read, write, and execute. And this section of the permission string here pertains to the group. Let's move on. So the last group of three here pertains to other. And this is also known as world, essentially, everybody else. So basically, other pertains to a user other than the user that owns the file and a group other than the group that owns the file. It's basically everybody else. Neither of the two that you see here, neither this user or this group. It's just public, it's writable, it's open, it's open to the world. What's interesting here is that if you were to remove the R, W, and X for the user, the first group of three, and change those to all hyphens, then the user that owns this file, or this folder, whatever it is, 
would not be able to access it, would not be able to do anything. Which is kind of odd, right? Because if you own it, you should be able to do something. And long story made short, you probably still could, but I'm trying to keep it simple. And in this case, if you didn't have permission over this particular folder, then everyone else would, everyone else that's not you, because specifically your permissions are nothing if I were to change it, but if you are other, meaning someone else, then you would be able to read and execute this directory. It's a little confusing, but it's going to make sense, I promise. Now back on the terminal, let's see some actual examples on my computer right here that we can use to better understand this. So again, I will execute ls-l, and I am in my home directory right now, slash home slash j again. I've gone over the Linux file system and the directory structure in a previous video. But what we can see right here is that we have mostly folders. They're colored blue in this case. That's not always the case. That's actually a shell customization you won't always see the blue color when you go to look at the output of the ls command. Most distributions actually configure that by default. But even if you don't have the colorization, you know which one of these is a folder versus a file based on the first character, like I mentioned. So the permissions of the first bunch of files here, basically all of these are, well, they're the same. So we have rw and x for user straight down. We have r hyphen x for group straight down. And we have r hyphen x for world or other straight down. And what that means is that since I own each of these directories, then the first group of the permission strings after the d is going to apply to me the r, w, and x. I have full permission. I can do anything I want. r, w, and x in a group is the most you can possibly have in that group. So I can read it, I can write to it, and I can execute it. Now, if I was not the user that owns this file, and I was somebody else, but I did exist in the group that has ownership of that object, then I would be applied the r hyphen x permissions. So I would be able to read the contents of the directories. I wouldn't be able to modify them because the w is missing, but I would be able to go into the directories because x is set and same for world. So essentially everyone can read the contents of these directories. Everyone can execute or go inside these directories but only I can actually modify the contents of these directories. Now, let's take a look at the permission string for this file right here. Notice that X is not set anywhere. Absolutely no one will be able to execute that text file as a program. I'm going to give you an example of that. I'm going to edit that file with nano. And currently it's empty. So what I'm going to do is execute the ls-l command. And instead of executing that against my current working directory, I want to see the contents of the slash Etsy directory instead. I'm going to warn you, there's actually a proper way to create a script. So even though this is technically accurate, you wouldn't actually begin a script with a command. But this isn't a scripting video. We can get into that in another video. I'm going to hold Control and press O to save the file. Then I will hold Control and press X to exit out. If I check the contents again, you can see that the size is no longer zero like it was. And it didn't even give me any errors when I tried to save the file that let me do it. And that's because I am the owner of that file. I have the W bit set right here. So to execute a file as if it were a program, basically a script, you just type dot forward slash, and then you type the name of the file which I've done right here, so I'll press enter. And I get permission denied. Well, that's kind of weird. Why did I get permission denied if I am the owner of that file? Well, as you could probably guess, execute is not set, so I don't have permission to execute that file. Nobody does. So regardless of who you are, it's not going to execute. Now you can get around that by typing something like bash and then the file name. And in this case, I'm essentially telling the bash interpreter to go ahead and just read the contents of this file and execute it. This will still work. As you can see, it gave me the output of the Etsy directory. Now, I didn't execute the script, but I did tell bash to execute what's inside the script. But I'm still not able to execute the script directly because, again, permission is denied. 
So how do I actually change that? Well, we have a dedicated command that allows us to change the permissions on an object. And the command is the chmod command, as you see here. And what I want to do is add a permission bit to that file. So I'm going to type plus, and then the permission bit that I want to add. And I want to add x, so I can execute that file. And then I type the name of the file that I want to change. This one right here, I'll press enter. And let's look at the output again and see how it's different. Now straight away, you can notice two things that are different here. For one, the color of this file is now green. But again, that's a shell-specific customization. You can't always rely on colorization. It's nice when you have it. Green typically means executable. But again, you're not always going to have colors. Now we could also see here that the X bit was added to each section of the permission string. That makes sense. Because when I executed this command right here, I basically wrote plus X. I didn't specify user, group, or world. I just said, give it execute. And it did exactly what I told it to. It gave it execute to everything. So unless you tell it what in particular you want to add the X bit to, it's just going to add it to everyone. So what you could do instead is use minus instead of plus to take it away. But you can also clarify user, group, or other. So for example, if I type u, u minus x means the user subtract the x bit. So chmod should remove the x bit from only the user when I execute this command. And sure enough, that's exactly what it did. So if I was to try to execute it myself, it's not going to work. Because again, I don't have the execute bit set for my user. I don't have permission to do that. So what I'm going to do is change that to a plus, And that's going to allow me to add the execute bit to the user specifically. So I'll press enter on that. And then what I'm going to do is change it again. I'm going to target the group. I'm going to subtract x. And then for other, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to subtract the executable bit from other, but I'm adding it to the user. And as you can see, my user has full permission to that file. I can read it, I can write to it, I can execute it as a program, but no one else has the ability to execute it other than myself. So that means I am able to type dot forward slash and then the file name. It's not going to give me an error this time. It's going to actually do what I told it to do. It's going to execute it. And since the contents of that file contained a command, when I execute it, it's just going to execute that command. It's the same as if I was to type ls-l slash etsy myself. It's going to give me the same output because it is the same thing. What I can also do is target the group, subtract r for read. And I can do the same thing for other as well. I'm going to take that away. And it's kind of weird because group has the ability to write to the file. They can't read it. They can't execute it, but they can change it. So since that's a little weird, let's go ahead and fix that. So from the group, I'm going to subtract the w bit. And we can see that nobody other than myself has access to this particular file. Nobody can read the contents of it. Nobody can write changes to it, and nobody can execute it other than myself. I am the owning user, and these are the permissions for my user. These are the best possible permissions in this section that you can have. And to be honest, I actually prefer having full access myself and denying all other access because unless it's something that I really do want to be readable by everybody else, I generally just subtract all the other bits and keep it to myself unless I have a very specific reason not to do that. So let's have a little bit of fun. I'm going to remove my own ability to write to that file. And then what I'm going to do is echo the name of this YouTube channel. And with the double greater than sign, I'm going to try to append this to the end of the file. If I only had one greater than sign, it would actually replace the file with the contents that you see here. But 
two greater than signs will actually append it to the end, which is safer usually. And I'm going to write that to the test file here, except I'm not because permission is denied. And that makes sense because I took away the write permission from the user. If I was to add it back and try it again, you can see here that it did actually write Learn Linux TV to the end of the file. Now what I'm going to do is edit that file because that's not actually a command. So that's kind of weird to have a command and then something that's not a command. So I'll just take that away. I'll save the file, but you get the idea. Now you can actually combine the chmod command as well. You don't have to do one command for every one bit you want to add or subtract. So for a group, I can add read and write, and I can do it all in one command. And I'm going to use that same file as the test subject. And sure enough, you can see that the group has the ability to read and write to the file, but not execute. And other still has the ability to do basically nothing. And as we can see here, I was able to add the read and write bit all in one command without having to execute a separate command for R and a separate command for write. That just lets you be a little bit more efficient. Now, what I'm going to do in this video at this time is get a little bit more advanced. So I want to make sure that you understand everything that we've gone over so far. Feel free to pause the video, try a few experiments on your end, or just rewatch a specific section. It's not going to be overly complicated, but it is going to go to the next level because I'm going to talk to you about the bit scores for each value. Basically, there's a numerical representation of read, write, and execute. And it's very important that you know this and understand it. But in order to understand how this works, the numerical representation, you have to know how everything works up to this point. Don't rush it. Just make sure that you follow along and we'll go ahead and continue. Now, each permission bit has a specific number attached to it. So R for read has a value of four. W for write has a value of two. X for execute has a value of one. So just take a moment to commit this to memory. Again, R has a value of four, W has a value of two, and X has a value of one. So now that you understand what the values are for each of those permission bits, what does that even mean when it comes to understanding permissions? Well, if I was to execute the chmod command to change the permissions of a file or a folder, I could continue using the plus x, minus x, plus r, minus r style that we've been doing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we could get a little bit more efficient when we understand how the numerical values work. So what I'm going to do as an experiment is give you a command and then I'll explain it. I'm going to execute chmod 770 and then the file that we've been working with. Now I haven't gone over what 770 means as of yet, but I'm going to execute this command. And let's take a look at it. So what we have here is RW and X for user and RW and X for group and nothing for other. Now how did that happen though? How does 770 correlate to this? So when you use the chmod command with numerical values, you have three digits here that you can use. And then you have the name of the file. Now, obviously the question marks will not work, but we need to understand what each digit means when it comes to the chmod command with numerical values. So the first digit here is for user, the second is for a group, and the third is for other. Now, when I executed this command, the first digit that I had here was a seven. Now it might be starting to click for some of you already because four plus two plus one equals seven. And what that translates to is R, W, and X. You're adding the totals of each to equal seven. And that basically means all the permissions. For the second digit, that was also a seven. And then the last one was zero. So again, we have user, group, and other. Seven is the highest it can possibly ever get. 
Each position here can never be higher than that. We got the 7 by adding 4 plus 2 plus 1. Same thing here. And then for other, aka world, we have a 0. We don't want anyone else other than the user in the group to access this particular file. We left it at 0, which is equivalent to hyphen, 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 basically nothing. If I was to, say, take away the 7 in the second digit, replace it with a 5, let's see what happens. We have full permissions here for user, which is the 7, and we have read and execute, which is 5. Again, read is 4, and execute is 1. I went over the point values earlier. Again, R is equal to 4, W is equal to 2, and X is equal to 1. So by adding read, which is 4, plus execute, which is 1, we got a 5. And that translates to R hyphen X. And again, 0 is nothing. I could do something completely weird. 725, for example. Pretty much a horrible permission to have. Let's see what it looks like. And before I press enter, see if you can guess what the permission string is going to be on that test file before I show you the output of the ls command. Are you ready? Let's do it. We have read, write, and execute for user, as we would expect. But for the group, we have only w. Again, the point value of w is 2, and we have exactly 2 here, which is how we got the w. So we have a file here that the group is able to write to, but not read or execute. Strange, but it is the case. And then we have 5, and we got to 5 by adding r, which again is 4, and x, which again is 1, equals 5. So that's how you can understand the numerical values of the chmod command. And this style right here, is very common. This permission number here is not very common, but this command style where you have the numerical version with the chmod command, that is very common. Now let's take a look at another example. I'm going to execute the ls-l command again, but instead of showing you the contents of the home directory, I'm going to show you the contents of my downloads directory. Now the file names are wrapping a bit over to another line, but there's only three lines here. These file names are just very long. I was working on some other videos, and these are some files that I downloaded as part of other videos I've been working on. But the takeaway here is I have three files in my home directory and my downloads directory, and they all have the permission string of read and write for user and group and just R for other. So what I'm going to do is clear the screen, and what I want to do is change the permissions for every file in my downloads directory all in one shot. How would I do that? So I'm going to execute chmod, and the permission string I want to be 6, and of course that's read and write, basically 4 plus 2, and I want the group to have nothing and other to have nothing. And I'm going to execute that against my downloads directory. But the problem here is that this is actually going to break my downloads directory because it's going to remove the execute bit. I won't be able to go inside that folder. So if I want to make all of the files within my downloads directory to be readable and writable by only me, so what I could do actually is add the recursive option, dash capital R, and what that's going to do is change the permissions for everything that is inside that directory all in one shot. Unfortunately though, this is still not a good idea. Because while it will give me the correct permissions that I want on the files, it's still going to make the downloads directory a permission of 600, which again means I can't get inside that directory anymore. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this command up is because this is actually something that a lot of newcomers run into, and that is how do you recursively change the permissions of everything inside a directory but only affect the files? And that's going to be a tutorial in and of itself because that requires me to teach you the find command which I definitely should do a video on that anyway. In fact, I will. But what we could do for now is take away the dash R option, because the dash R option is only good if everything underneath is basically the same type of object, directories or whatnot. We can instead do slash and then star. 
and that gives me the permission string that I want on those files. Now with the find command, you can actually find specific types of objects. So for example, you could choose to find files or folders or both. And then you can manipulate the permissions on them based on what type of file or what type of object they actually are. But again, that's a tutorial on the find command. That's beyond the scope. But what I did want you guys to be aware of is that the dash R option exists and it stands for recursive and it will change the permissions for everything underneath the object that you're applying it to. It'll allow you to make those changes in one shot. Now, how do you change the ownership of a file to be owned by someone else? Let's go ahead and explore that. Now, on this laptop, I have two users. I have my user, Jay, which I've been using the entire video so far. But if I take a look at the home directory, I have another user on my computer. I have Batman on my computer. And yes, Batman does use my laptop from time to time. It's a very powerful laptop, and sometimes you just need a very powerful computer to find out what the Joker is up to. Actually, I just created that user a few minutes ago. But anyway, we have two users on the system. Now, everything in my home directory is owned by me. And the same is true when it comes to my downloads directory. And this is an example of where the dash R option actually is more useful. So if I was to change ownership of a file to be owned by a different user, I would execute the chown command, which is an abbreviation of change ownership. So I'm going to change ownership of an object from me to Batman. And I want to make the entire downloads directory owned by Batman. So I actually will add the dash R option right there and I will execute that against the downloads directory. Now it's telling me that the operation is not permitted. I don't have permission to do this. And I knew this would happen, but I wanted to basically teach you guys that you need to have sudo or root level access to change the ownership of an object. Now you could argue I am giving away my downloads directory. I am just giving it to Batman. I don't want to own it anymore. I'm just giving it away. If you wanted to give something of your own away to a friend, you would just give it to them. You wouldn't ask for permission if you own it. But in Linux, you have to actually ask permission if you own it because you have to have permission to change the ownership to another user to make them own it. So what we could do is put sudo in front of the command and that will give us the ability to do that. And since I have dash R here, then if this works, that should change the permissions of the downloads directory to be owned by Batman and also everything underneath it all in one shot. And it let me do it this time. Now we can see that Batman owns the downloads directory. So if I wanted to list the storage of that directory, I can't. If I wanted to go inside that directory, I can't. So in order to show you the contents, I'm going to have to use sudo and then ls-l against downloads. And now I can see the contents. Everything is owned by Batman. But here we still have my name for the group. So let's go ahead and fix that too. Now here we have the command that we use to change the ownership to Batman. So I can put a colon here and then the name of the group that I want to own the file. So in one shot, I'm not only changing Batman to be the owner of the file, if I didn't already do that, I'm also changing it to be owned by the Batman group as well. So it's user colon group. And as you can see, the group Batman now owns each of these files. And to reverse it, I could simply do this. And this will change the ownership back to my user and my group. But wait a minute, what I'm gonna do is take away the group and just keep the colon. Let's see what happens. So we could see that my user and my group owns the downloads directory again, even though I left the group out, I just have a colon, I didn't add the group there. If you actually use the colon and you don't specify a group, it'll actually default to your user's group. So I didn't have to actually type out J, I just typed colon if the user and the group are going to be the same. And now, I can list the contents of the downloads directory without using sudo since I own it again. And you can see the same permissions here. 
I own everything here and my group owns everything here. Permissions in Linux can be a bit tricky to understand, but I think with enough practice, you guys will get it no problem. And I hope this video has helped you understand the concept of permissions in Linux. And let me know what you thought of this video in the description down below. I have some awesome videos coming very soon, so make sure you subscribe if you haven't already done so. And I'll see you again very soon.